Chapter 4 Those of special circumstance can find themselves alone by the fields, the house, the mountain crag, the blood begets the bone. Friend of foes, and fare thee well, watch out for shadows black, for darkness comes to them too soon, winged teeth, bared blades, and trap. They want what is different, but as all we want the same. Thus blood becomes the birthright, and thy night becomes thy shame. They judge us by the difference, they judge us from thy teeth, but we watch their necks, we'll string them up, and leave them there to bleed. Vampire Poem of Unknown Origin Dernus was dozing in his loft room, listening to the fire spark and pop as the wet wood burnt away. His sleepy mind was churning over thoughts of war and warriors, kingdoms and traitors, and of the legends of old. He let himself melt into and rove through his thoughts, listening to nothing but the fire, the rain hammering on the stained glass windows, and the wind howling through the dark afternoon. It would be night soon, and there was nothing better than hunting in the rain. He let his eyelids droop some more. Behind his comfy chair, propped up in the corner of his room, was a tall archway made from black stone and metal scaffolding, strapped to the wall with thick gray rope. It leant out from the wall and over a wooden lectern holding a thick brown book. The black stone flickered in the candlelight. The old vampire turned his head to check on the thing in the corner as if it might have moved then turned back to the fire to close his eyes again, enjoying the warmth of the big armchair and the soft upholstery beneath his paper-like fingers. All was quiet in the arc abbey. Just how he... There came a banging noise from the corridor outside his room. Dernus sighed, pinching his forehead with his finger and thumb. The door was thrown open with a crash and in burst a dripping farden. He collapsed to his knees, palms splayed on the stone tiles, breathing hard and trying to fight from coughing. Fardin! The vampire hauled himself upright and rushed to the mage's side. Through hoarse gaspings, Dernus made out the word water and went to a pitcher on the bedside table. He filled a cup and gave it to him. Fardin down the whole thing in one gulp, then tossed the vessel aside. He stood upright and groaned. That feels better. I have never run that far that fast before. Farden took a moment to swear before coughing again and seeking the refuge of the other comfy chair by the fire. The vampire followed him and watched him slump into it. You've been gone for almost a week. We were starting to get anxious, he told him. His friend was still struggling to get his breath back. Farden, hold still. Jarna spread his thin fingers over the mage's forehead and the tired man went rigid. Farden's eyes shook as his vision burst into color. He could have sworn his skin vibrated. The vampire removed his hand and Farden shook his head, blinking and wriggling his jaw experimentally. He could feel himself twitching with a strong spell. By the gods, that felt good. Why have you never done that before? said Farden, blinking owlishly. Jolting the mind like that too many times can kill a man, even one as strong as you. Jonas looked at his old friend. Mud, twigs, scrapes and wounds covered Farden's back and shoulders. His cloak was ripped to shreds, and a new sword dangled almost free in the loose strap around his back. Blood oozed from several wounds, some fresh, some old, and his face was a mess of stubble and bruises. He looked as if he had been dragged backwards through a forest and a river, thought Darnus, but at least he was alive. Farden had regained his breath thanks to the spell, and most of the color had returned to his cheeks. But he still had deep black bars under his eyes, and his dark hair was bedraggled muddle. <clears throat> I have news. Farden cleared his throat again and leant back in the encapsulating chair. Darnus slept back to his seat with surprising agility for someone who appeared so old. Well, let's get to it. What happened? Well, I found Jurgen on the hills where you said he'd be, south of Ben. Farden paused for another cough. <clears throat> and for a hermit, he wasn't at all shy when he came to trying to kill me. Anyway, in short, you were right. Jurgen and the Sirens found our book in the Tossambar Mountains before the war, in an old elf stronghold, and tried their scaly hands at using it. Jurgen was one of the men who studied it, and with their wizards, he said wizards with a hint of superiority in his voice, they tried to cast its spells. Apparently the book was some sort of dark elf summoning manual for bringing creatures over from the other side. They cast the spells in it? The vampire was shocked. 
That's what Jurgen said, and for some reason I trust him. They went through it systematically from cover to cover, and their wizards tested the ghosts and beasts and skull guard prisoners. Jurgen thinks that's why someone would steal the book, to get at the powerful beasts hidden in its pages. But the Arca have fought their fair share of monsters. You were there five years ago when the Minotaurs came out of the Ephyar marshes. Why should this book be any different? He said this book held one spell that the scaly bastards feared so much they never dared to cast it. What spell was it? Dernis entwined his fingers in thought and stared at the fire. They never found out, but it was something that scared the life out of the sirens and their dragons. A terrifying beast referred to as the Mouth of Darkness. They were foolish. Foolish indeed, said the vampire, as he watched flames lick at wood and stone. Jurgen also mentioned that if somebody powerful enough wanted to attempt to summon this thing, that, that they would need a great source of magic, perhaps like one of the Dark Elf Wells, guessed Darnus. Exactly. The mage smiled at his friend's intuition. As far as I know, the last one we found was near Arfell, north of the library and several miles in the ground. With barely any magic left in it, if I heard right, Varden added. The heat from the fire curled around him like a blanket. And as far as I know, there aren't any left in Emanesca, but Jurgen seems to think there are a few we might have missed. Indeed, I've spent almost my entire life trying to track them down. It was one of the reasons I came to Albion. This soggy land is littered with old elf ruins, but so far it's been a fruitless search. He tapped his thin lips thoughtfully, deciding what to do. This is dire news, Farden, especially if the Lycan is right about an undiscovered well. If we're assuming that the thief stole the manual to get at the spells, then we have to suppose they intend to release this beast on the world. Why else go to such lengths? Darnus spoke his words with an ominous tone, a cold voice in a vacuous cave. And if Jurgen was right about the size and power of this creature, then we could all be in serious danger, and I don't just mean the Arca. Whoever stole that book wants to turn a Maneska upside down. Farden looked at the vampire, and their eyes locked in a steely embrace. We need to get you to Krauslung with all speed. Darnus leapt from his chair with the alacrity that belied his ears. He went to the archway and lectern standing in the corner. He flipped the dry pages of the dusty tome on the lectern, his fingers scrolling over the lines of brown ink. I'll need most of the night to prepare the quick door to the citadel. You need to rest. I can imagine that you've been through enough to get this information, so I advise you just get some sleep, friend, he said, as his pale blue eyes scanned the writing. The mage took a deep breath and gathered his cloak behind him. What was it like? asked Ernest, rather abruptly. His finger had stopped on the page. Farden looked over at the vampire's back. Imagine seeing death in the eyes of a nine-foot-tall wolf. The mage paused, recalling the blur of a fight with the grimace. Dernus turned to face him, a humorous look in his pale eyes. It strikes me as odd, my good friend, that you should ever meet anything resembling death. Every time I fear the worst, you come back to us with no more than a handful of scratches. I envy you, Farden, out there face to face with creatures like Jurgen. <coughs> envy me? Farden threw him a quizzical look. Are you serious? He lifted his torn cloak up over his breastplate and points us to the deep groove made by the lichen's raking claws. This isn't a handful of scratches. An inch further up and I would be either dead or howling away somewhere out in the mountains. Jarnus turned back to his book. Come now. I know you better than that. You crave danger. There was a pause. That's why I'm always telling you to be careful. Here we go, muttered Farden with a mock sigh. The vampire turned around again as the mage slumped back into the chair. No, I'm not going to lecture you. For a change. Fine. All I'm saying is that we've known each other a long time. Darnus tapped the side of his head with the pale finger. I know why you came here to Albion, and what you're trying to hide from, and I've seen how you deal with it. Just remember there are those that care about you, and that even you have your limits. The vampire crossed his arms and stared at the mage. Farden felt a little uncomfortable, as he always did in these moments, and tapped his van braces with the fingernail. It's not likely I'll find them just yet, though. Darnus sighed. Just don't overreach, he said. 
And in truth, I do envy you because you're the one who gets to go out there and make a difference. Fight the battles and the monsters. Uncover the secrets and be the warrior. My days are long drawn out and my memories are slowly fading, Garden. I can't remember the last time I held a sword. By the gods, it must be at least 50 years ago. Varden itched for the opportunity to change the subject. That's because you're an historian, old friend. These books are your monsters. I couldn't go out there without your advice and knowledge, Jornis. Have no fear. I'm sure there's still some fight in you yet. Ha! That'll be the day. Varden smirked, picked up a nearby book, and blew the dust from the cover. He cleaned it with the palm of his hand and squinted at the faded title. Treatises on shapeshifting. That's a bit dangerous, isn't it, Durnus? Playing with the old dame in arts? Durnus looked at the book and shrugged. Just curious. And it's not just daemons that can shapeshift, my dear mage. What do you think I am? Or Jurgen, for that matter. Both wolf and bat curses have their roots in the ancients. He said, wagging a didactic finger in the air. Did you know that the powers that bind a lichen are completely opposite to that of a vampire? If a vampire were to be bitten by a lichen, one of pure breed, then it could technically cancel the two out. What would happen? asked Farden. But the vampire shrugged again. Who knows? Hence the book. He sighed. But anyway, you need rest. It'll be a while before I'm ready. And please heed my words, Farden, as your friend. I know what your temper can be like. <clears throat> I shall. Farden walked towards the door and pulled it open. His old friend was right. There were a few people in the world that he cared about. He thought of one in particular, an idea blossoming in his mind. Dernus, could you send me to the quick door at the spire? The vampire thought for a moment and then nodded. I don't see why not, if that's what you want. It'd be good to see old Mains Mark before I go to the city. Farden turned to go, leaving the old man to his books. Dernus could have sworn he heard the mage whisper a thank you before he closed the door. <clears throat> Alessi was wandering the corridors of the Ark Abbey Tower. After hearing a rumor that Farden was back and feeling wounded, she had gone looking for him with angst in her heart. It was late, and her search of his room in the cavernous dining hall had been fruitless. She was wandering up and down the spiral staircases of the Abbey Tower, peering at empty rooms, listening to the wooden doors of locked quarters and rooms home to sleeping soldiers. The maid earnestly skipped up the steps to the training halls near the bell tower, holding her skirts above her shoes. A dull thudding tumbled down the stone hallway on her left, and she paused mid-stride. Yellow torchlight spilled from a door half-closed, halfway along, while the rest of the hallway was bathed in lazy moonlight pouring down from a thin, arched window at its far end. Elysi crept forwards, running her hand over the rough walls. Her work-worn fingers felt the cracks and pitted surface of the gray stone. The noise grew louder as she approached, a sharp, deep crack of fire against wood. She reached the door and peered through the gap in the hall. Her pupils shrank in the bright yellow torchlight. Flashes of light and fire skipped over the wooden beams of the yawning roof and she shuffled around to get a better look at the cause of the noise. There, standing shirtless and sweating, was Farden throwing bolt after bolt of fire at a wooden, man-shaped target. The mannequin swung wildly, suspended from the wall and shackled to the floor on short iron chains. It rocked and bucked under the powerful blasts of magic. Farden wore nothing except a pair of black trousers, and in the bright torchlight, Alessi could see his chest heaving with deep, arduous gulps of air. His shoulders were bathed in sweat, and there was something else. Alessi's eyes were now fixated on his back. Lines and lines of thin black script cover the mage's shoulders and lower back, punctuated by swirling elegant lines and spirals clambering over his collarbone, ribs, and shoulder blades. Four symbols ran along his spine, runes with shapes and strange interwoven words. Unless he couldn't help notice the dark faces of telling bruises running through the black lettering, and every time the magic surged through his body, the script flashed and glowed. Words sporadically lit up all over his skin, glittering and dancing with a bright white light. The chambermaid was transfixed, locked in a mesmerized stare. She tried to follow the lines of script as they glowed and make sense of the foreign words. Farden threw yet another bolt of fire at the target, 
whose carved wooden face was now charred and smoldering. If a mannequin could look depressed, this one managed it. The mage paused his onslaught for a moment, clenching his fists. <clears throat> a whirring, crackling sound hummed through the air for a moment before Fardum bared an open palm and sent tidal waves of lightning to wash over the wooden statue. With a crack, the topmost chain melted and the mannequin fell to the floor in a burst of cinders. The mage cursed and went to find his shirt. Alessi flinched back from the door and ran back down the hallway with mixed feelings of relief and fear. That night, she dreamt of wounded mages and hulking monsters, of deep caves and ghostly ships made of bones and fingernails, of fire burning under her sheets. Sleep ran from her, and in the morning she awoke with stinging eyes dripping with cold sweat. Farden opened his eyes to find winter sunlight jabbing through his open window. I'm pausing for one second. I need to press some loud buttons. Sippy sippy, and then we shall continue. He found he was lying on his front and swiftly pushed himself up and out of bed, stretching with a newfound readiness. He had rested well in a deep, dreamless sleep, and now he felt fit and eager to get going. Whatever the old vampire had done to him had worked, and Farden resolved to ask him about it another time. He finished stretching and went to find his scattered clothes and armor. He ran a wet cloth over his grimy face and neck, wiping the dirt away. One of his teeth was loose, probably from the fight. Farden tongued it in an investigative way. He pushed a finger into his jaw, muttering something, and the tooth settled back into place. It did move again. I'm sorry, can I just for a second say how much I fucking wish I had that kind of magic so I could just fix my fucking tooth? Okay. <clears throat> you imagine the amount of money I would save on dental work? Farden moved to the window and let the cold breeze of the morning chill his face. The winter sun was hovering near the horizon behind the trees, lingering behind the leafless branches of the forest of Dern. A bird sang somewhere below in the Ark Abbey grounds. The smell of baking bread from the kitchens hovered on the breeze. The mage's stomach rumbled, and he hurriedly put on his tunic, boots, and armor, and strode out of his room. He would eat in Krauslung. <clears throat> when he reached the vampire's room, the door was unlocked. Varden walked straight in. Magic throbbed and hummed in the air. He could feel it washing over him, tingling in his shoulders. The fire had long burnt out, and now only candles lit the dim room. In the corner, the archway of black stone and steel was filled with a haze, as if a silk veil quivered constantly and violently in the center of the tall doorway. The quick door seemed to be open. Dernus reposed in a wooden chair near a desk, eyes closed, dozing. Farden walked quietly up to him and put a gentle hand on the old man's shoulder. The vampire stirred. Farden? Hmm, <clears throat> what time is it? asked Dernus hoarsely. Just before noon. It'll be afternoon in Mainsmark by now. It's time for me to go. Right! Derna slapped his knees and stood up, all tiredness instantly forgotten, and headed to the lectern to check on the vibrating quick door. It's ready. It took me a while to do for some reason. The Albion magic seems to be weaker than normal. The quick door in Mainsmark is a powerful one, though, so it wasn't impossible. The vampire rambled away as he leafed through the pages, preparing the next spell. You know I don't understand this time and space magic, my old friend. That's your area of expertise, not mine. Barden smiled warmly. 
It's all about patience, my good mage. Varden squinted at the hazy surface of the quick door and ran his hand over the archway, careful not to stray too close to the budzing threshold. The obsidian surface of the stone blocks felt alarmingly hot to the touch. Think of it as trying to open and close a window a thousand miles away with no more than a rope and a long pole. That doesn't really help. Dernus thought for a moment, looking at the ceiling. No, it doesn't, does it? Well, all seems like it's an order, Farden. Time to travel. Now remember, hold your breath before you step in and watch your feet. It looks like it's snowing on the other side, Darna said, pointing. Farden gazed at the little flecks of snow tumbling through the foot of the portal, settling in a little patch on the top step of the quick door. Great, he said. <clears throat> he had hoped it might have been a little warmer in the city, but apparently he was wrong. The long winter won again. See you soon, old friend. Farden shook the vampire's hand and stepped closer to the portal. Jarnas flipped through the pages of his book. Try to remember every single detail and be sure in your opinions before you voice them to the Archmages. You have a meeting with them this evening in the Great Hall. The whole council will be gathering. Jarnas looked at the sword on the mage's back and sniffed. And Farden? The mage turned. The vampire narrowed his pale eyes. I can smell blood on your sword. Who else did you fight besides Jurgen? Farden lingered for a moment on the best excuse. Some people just don't listen, he said abruptly. He shrugged, eyes searching the wooden door, floor for an escape from the ripper man he knew was coming. The vampire merely sighed. Don't get sloppy, Farden. You are an instrument of the Arca first and foremost, a finely tuned weapon of precision and tact. There are rules, and there are consequences for poor decisions, mage. Bear them in mind next time you draw your sword. I watched your uncle go down this violent path a long time ago, and look where it got him. This is the last time I'll tell you. Dernus's gaze was grave, more disappointed than angry, which stung the mage all the more. There was no need to bring up his uncle, he thought. I won't, he muttered, before stepping up to the doorway. Farden felt the icy blast of the quick door on his skin. As he lifted his foot, the door grabbed him in a vice-like grip, dragging him forwards into a shining white tunnel of light and noise. Wind tried to rip the breath from his lungs, and freezing gales attacked his watering eyes as he plummeted through the doorway. In a blink, it was over. <coughs> Farden stumbled onto the wet, frozen grass of a Mainsmark hillside, putting a hand in a patch of snow to steady himself. Behind him, the quick door fizzled shut. The mage shook his head free from the dizziness and rose shakily to find a soldier standing beside him. The early afternoon sunlight glinted off his steel breastplate, causing the emblem of the Arca, a gold set of scales, to shine and glitter. Farden nodded to the man, who dipped his helmet in response and wiped the amused smirk from his face. Farden threw him a narrowed look as he wiped himself down. I'd like to see you try to land more gracefully he said, and the soldier made an effort to stand a little straighter, timidly clearing his throat. Still dizzy, Farden said no more and walked to look out across the stunning countryside he had grown up in. The landscape was as breathtaking as he remembered. The tall Osfen Mountains stretched out for miles and miles in all directions, as far as the eye could see, puncturing the wintry sky with their snow-capped summits and scraping at the heavy gray clouds with their rocky teeth. Beneath the jagged peaks and down in the snow-locked valleys, waterfalls played amongst rocks, fjords of ice and farmsteads, like the one he had known as a very small boy. To the north he could see the deadly slopes of Loki, the tallest mountain in Amanesca, towering over the rocky vista. Below him on the steep hillsides, villages and towns sat wreathed in wood smoke, peeking out of the snowdrifts. Farden looked down the hill at Mainsmark, the traditional home of the Arcus fighting forces. It perched on a snow-draped slope, a cluster of townhouses, inns, and dozens of barracks. The buildings were tall and proud, elegantly built from gray stone and pine, topped with tall, arched wooden roofs of slate. Chimneys belched gray haze, and the sounds of a busy afternoon in the market floated across the cold mountain air to Farden's wind-bitten ears. Scattered memories ran like rabbits through the fields of the mage's mind as he walked across the hillside. Mainsmark, 
<clears throat> was the long established home of the Briton and of the school where every mage studied, where Farden had studied as a child and teenager. He could still smell the strange, ever present burning odor of the place, feel the rough wood of the floors, the beds, and taste the watery yellow gruel. He could feel the constant thrum of magic from the instructors and classmates. The school of the Ritten had been a cruel world of bullying, spells, and constant fear. Many of his classmates had died along the way, victims of an accidental knife thrust or caught by a wayward spell. Vicious competition plagued the prestigious school, and Farden was sure nothing had changed. His class of prospective written had been whittled down to just three exhausted candidates. Farden had barely made it into the final cut. He remembered standing before the masters on his final day, beaten and bruised, pulsating with magic, feeling blood run down his brow and hearing his name on their stern lips. It had been torture, every moment, but it had made him a man, taught him the true face of magic, and shown him the wild nature behind Amanesca. Varden could still see the scribe's whalebone needle carving the words into his back, his book. The mage strode up the slippery hillside towards the spire, a huge black tower that perched on the summit of the Mainsmark hillside and climbed hundreds of feet into the sky. Here the written lived and trained and slept when they had the chance. As he approached, he could feel the power vibrating through the walls of the tall building emanating from the parapets and walkways hanging from the spire. He could feel it like a wind on his skin. <clears throat> Guards and soldiers swarmed around the base of the tower like ants, and Farden spotted a few written amongst them, hooded and cloaked like he was, unmistakable to those who could spot it. A written walked with a certain assurance, a swagger that only a living weapon can sport. The Magic Council had been rebuilding the ranks of the Ritten ever since the war, and now, even after the skirmishes in Aethyar, their numbers were greater than ever before. From what he had gathered from Darnus, there were now almost 300 mages training in the spire, and over half of them carried the book. Farden reached the foot of the spire and made for the entrance. <clears throat> As he walked closer to the door, a deep vibration could be heard, like a large bell tolling under a hill. Afraid you can't go in, sir. Too many already in there, said a short man in uniform who stood at the doorway. He pointed inside with his thumb. Farden peered through the doorway into the enormous atrium of the spire, a cavernous hall filled with stairs and corridors running in every imaginable direction. Hanging in the middle of the atrium was a colossal dragon scale suspended in the air by great steel chains. It quivered with energy, making a deep whining sound. Too many written mages in the spire at one time could send the other men mad from the pure power of raw magic. The beaten scale was like a warning bell for the spire, ringing whenever the magic grew to dangerous levels. It was annoying, but necessary. Farden nodded in reluctant acquiescence and withdrew to a nearby rock. He watched several people rud at brief headaches and listened to the scale slowly quieten down. The mage shrugged to himself. Krauslund could wait for a little while. Cheska was standing in her room, watching the messenger hawk flutter around her windowsill. The poor bird was trying to find a place to land amidst the frozen snow on the ledge, flapping and mewing and being altogether useless. As soon as it came close enough, she snatched the wooden canister from its leg and the bird flew off, back to whomever had sent it. She snapped the tube open and took out the scrap of yellow parchment. Three hastily scribbled words were all she needed to read. Cheska held the note in her hand and concentrated hard with muttering lips. There was a brief flash of light, and the paper note became ash in her hand. She winced, sucking at her singed finger. <coughs> <coughs> the sound of the scale below her reached her ears, and she immediately made to leave, checking herself in a polished bronze mirror before opening the door. A young mage stood in the doorway, leaning against the wall, hand poised to knock. Afternoon, Cheska. Brim smiled a toothy smile and winked at her. It didn't suit him. It made him look like he had a twitch. Oh, Brim, I was just leaving, Cheska said. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. 
Well, I'm going to the market. We can walk if you want, he offered. She nodded, sighed inwardly, and let him walk up to the stairs. Farden was getting bored. Some sunlight had broken through the heavy clouds, so he had thrown his hood back to soak up the rare warmth, feeling the mountain breeze toy with his dark hair. A few soldiers he recognized acknowledged him in passing with silent nods. The other written were mostly courteous but curious of Farden. <coughs> the solitary mage had always been quiet around most of the others, preferring his own company, and it was no secret in the spire that they thought him dangerous and wild. Nevertheless, he had been a hero in Aethyar, and that afforded him a bit of respect, though he found it dwindled every year. The mage's eyes scanned the throngs of people milling around, looking for someone in particular. She must have heard the scale ring. Then he saw her. She never ceased to make his mouth hang slightly ajar. Cheska looked as stunning as ever. From his rock, he watched her weave through the crowds with all the grace of a cat, letting her piercing blue eyes rove over the multitude of faces, obviously looking for someone as well. Farden began to smile. Cheska's long blonde hair escaped from the edges of her hood and swayed hypnotically in the breeze. She always seemed to be smiling, ever since he had first seen her wandering the halls of the spire, nothing more than a nervous little girl new to the school. Her skin was paler than most. Like her hair, it betrayed her Skullguard ancestry. Her royal breeding was obvious in her gait and posture. Like him, she wore a dark cloak with a tight-fitting black tunic that hugged the curves of her body. It was common knowledge that Cheska was the daughter of Bane, the king of the powerful Skullguard Empire in the Northeast, and that made her a princess. For her to be living with the Arca, not to mention practicing their dangerous magic, was a massive political step for both countries, and a tough one. She had been supervised by a veritable horde of Skullguard minders every step of the way, through every year at the school. One by one, she had shrugged them off and immersed herself in the brutal world of magic. Farden had to admit she was good, better than any he had seen so far. It made their lives even more exciting and dangerous, as if they weren't enough already. The Ritten were forbidden to breed, one of the rules all Ritten had to abide by, or face exile or death by hanging. Farden let his eyes take in every inch of her. It had been a few months since he'd last seen her, and a warm, not entirely unexpected feeling spread across his chest. He spied that friend of hers, Burn or Brid or whatever his name was, following her like a loyal dog, hoping to be thrown a scrap. Farden set his jaw with an inkling of jealousy. As her deep, mountain-like eyes caught his, he got to his feet and grinned. Well, well, look what the griffin dragged in. Cheska smiled as the two came close in a firm embrace. She stood on her tiptoes and threw her arms around Farden's neck. He dared to give her a quick kiss on the cheek, and she stepped backwards with a sly look. A rare smile crept over the mage's lips, and he held her eyes a moment longer than necessary. The loyal dog coughed into his fist politely, breaking them out of their little trance. Oh, Farden, you remember Brim, don't you? He was in the same class that we've met a few times before. Good to see you again. Farden clamped the man's hand in an iron grip. Brim tried and failed to return his icy gaze, wincing at the handshake. You too, sir. What brings you to Mainsmark? Like all the others at the school, Brim must have heard the rumors about Farden. Official business in Krauslein. I have to be heading there soon, Farden said dismissively, looking at Cheska as she ran a handful of her hair through her fingers. A flash of something red caught his eye. That warm feeling in his chest suddenly turned cold. Tell me that's not what I think it is, he asked stonily. She laughed, shrugging off his concern. You're right. She pulled back her cloak sleeves and revealed a red band of metal wrapped around her slender wrist. It was a fjortla, a traditional bracelet that marked a trainee for being written. Supposedly, the rare red metal brought strength and perseverance to the wearer for the dangerous tattooing process a three-day ritual that only half of the candidates usually survived. Barden still had his old fjord last summer back at the Ark Abbey. <clears throat> we both got chosen. We'll be written in less than a month. 
Cheska smiled and put her hand on Farden's arm to show it off. Both of you? he asked. Both of us, Brim replied, baring his wrist and showing off his own circle of red metal. Farden found himself filled with anxiety. He couldn't even begin to care about Brim, but Cheska? That was a different matter. Here was one of the few people in the world he did care about, and now she was scheduled for the terrible, grueling ritual, something that could easily kill her. Cheska, this is serious, began Farden, but Cheska shook her head defiantly. Don't even start with that vulnerable woman shit. You'll start to sound like my father, she cursed. Farden glared at Brim for a moment, as if it was all his fault, but then thought better of arguing. Fair enough, I won't say another word. He held up his hands and shrugged. Walk with me for a while? Cheska smiled. She turned to Brim as she walked away. I'll come and find you later, Brim. I'll meet you in the market, she said. The young mage nodded, a little confused, and watched the two of them walk off through the throngs of people and soldiers. Great, he muttered, and with a wistful sigh, he turned and headed for the main smart market. Are you actually serious? Farden asked gingerly. Oh, don't be a hypocrite, Farden. You said you couldn't wait to go through with it when they chose you. Cheska ran a hand through her long blonde hair again. Farden could not help but sneak sideways looks at her. What did you think would happen anyway? That I would spend all these years training and then just turn it down? She huffed and looked away. It's just dangerous, Cheska, and you know... Farden trailed off, thinking of Jurgen. His boots kicked loudly at loose stones. They were walking down a quiet path that curved away from the main thoroughfare between Mainsmark and Krauslung. Behind them, the noisy bustle of the spire could still be heard over the sound of flags flapping and birds twittering. Cheska stopped abruptly under a rocky outcrop that bent over the thin path. I know what? she asked. You know... Farden waved a hand dismissively, but she caught it deftly and stepped closer to him, that look in her glacier eyes again. Cheska pulled at the red scarf around his neck. Still wearing the present I got you? She smiled. He pulled her closer and they kissed, lips locked in a passionate embrace. Farden's hand snaked around her back and pulled her closer to him until she stood on tiptoes and let her fingers tangle in his dark hair. He started to kiss her neck, letting her scent dizzy his head pulling her even closer as his hands moved down her back and legs. No, not here, Farden. She put a hand on his chest and leant back. He released her reluctantly. If we get caught, they'll throw you in the stocks, and who knows what my father would do. They wouldn't dare, he said with a sly grin. You're not a written yet. Why should it matter? Not here. Cheska kissed him again softly. I think I'll head back to the spire. She held a finger to her lips as he began to talk. <clears throat> I know you're worried, but I can do this, Farden. I've spent the last 12 years training for this, and the gods know I've struggled with my father every step of the way. I'm not going to let another stubborn man get in my way. Just be here for me, Farden. Annoyingly, she had a point, he thought. Farden nodded and stole another kiss on her cheek, making her laugh as she leapt away from him. Her sparkling eyes flicked to the city in the distance. Be careful in Krauslung, she said. Farden took her hand. Me? Be careful? What are a bunch of bureaucrats and their politics going to do to me? He laughed and winked. I'll see you soon. I hope so, replied Cheska, turning to walk back up the path. Tonight? Farden hissed, and she looked back over her shoulder. I'll find you, she said. The mage watched her until she had disappeared behind the little ridge. Politics, he muttered with a shake of his head. Politics and rules. He kicked a pebble for a good measure and watched it sail down the mountainside. About an hour's walk from Mainsmark, nestled in a deep valley between the twin peaks of Ursafel and Hargya, lay the immense citadel of Krauslung, a capital city of the Arca, home of the Archathedral and the ruling powers of the Magic Council. Farden reached the city just as the afternoon was starting to give way to another dark winter evening. The sky was still bright even though the clouds, but the cold darkness of night lingered on the horizon, ready to sneak through the mountains. 
The hooded mage strode over the frozen grass of the valley, staring up at the two steep mountains either side of him. Their sheer rocky faces were dark gray, sprinkled with a few hardy shrubs and pines. They towered over the city walls. The immense ramparts of Krauslung filled the gap between the two peaks, using their cliffs as a solid foundation for their thick stone defenses. Acres and acres of fields stretched out in front of the city, filling the gap between Mainsmark and Krauslung. Shacks that were home to hundreds of peasants squatted in the shadow of her sorry walls. A steady stream of travelers and city folk flowed through the massive main gate, its huge archway dominated by the gatehouse above it that almost rivaled the Arcabi at Leith in height. Thick stone battlements crested the walls, and from between them a small army of guards watched over the arriving visitors, peering down from their reclusive arrow slits. The long and stiff ceasefire with the sirens had made the Arca guards worry and suspicious over the years, ever fearing the shadow of a dragon or a siren spy. Even after 15 years, nobody was willing to forget. <clears throat> Farden joined the slow-moving throngs of people heading towards the city, boots crunching on the gravel of the wide road. He pulled his cloak around him to ward off the approaching cold. Merchants at the roadside called out to the passers-by, hoping to make a few more sales before night finally fell. Pigs and goats were being herded in small groups by young children covered in mud. A few dark-skinned men from Southern Pariah were sat around a campfire beside the road, curved swords at their side, muttering to each other in a low, foreign tongue. The smell of exotic spices and meats tickled Farden's nose. <clears throat> a fat man riding a sorry-looking black bear meandered between the people, occasionally whacking it with a thin stick to make it move faster. The beast just grumbled and kept moving at its own pace. After a short time spent weaving through the ever-increasing crowds, Farden reached the huge archway of the main gates. The thickness of the stone and the massive iron doors never ceased to amaze him, even for one as far traveled as he. The mage stared up in awe at the murder holes and gigantic stone blocks suspended above his head. I'm sorry, what is a murder hole? Is it a hole for murdering? <laughs> is it as obvious as it sounds? Okay, my bad. <clears throat> the guards eyed him morally for a moment as he passed beneath them. Then, recognizing what he was, they looked away quickly to glare at the next person. Farden pulled his hood down even further as he walked under the walls, thirty paces worth of thick mountain stone. Ahead of him was the main city, and from his vantage point at the gate he could see the whole of Krauslung spread out like an intricate carpet. The two great mountains, either side, dipped and fell, giving way to a narrow sloping valley that ended in a horseshoe-shaped harbor and the port of Rose with its legendary shipyards. From there, the bay and the cold burned sea stretched out for many leagues before stumbling across the islands of Skop in the far distance. Their dark blotches stretched out on the horizon like a half-drowned giant. To the east and west, the Osfen Mountains marched on for miles, Steep walls for warding off the bitter waves of the winter sea. The mage could smell the tangy salt in the air and hear the plaintive, hungry cries of the gulls in the wind. He smiled. Farden switched his attention back to the city. It had been many months since he had last has been there. He had almost forgotten the impressive view. On his right, leaning against the precipitous walls of Hardia, stood the Ark Cathedral forged from gray granite and white polished stone from the cliff cities in the west. <clears throat> a great hall perched on top of the colossal tiered fortress, crowned by two thin towers that stood on either side of its domed roof. These towers held the twin bells that shared their names with the two mountains that flanked the city, Ursafel on the left, Harja on the right. Farden had them heard them ring in years, not since the end of the war. <clears throat> like the layers of a gigantic cake, the Ark Cathedral spiraled downward to the city streets, its concentric curtain walls hiding libraries, halls, kitchens, barracks, training yards, and regal abodes for the two Ark Mages and the council members. Here was the throbbing heart of the Arca, where the balance of magic was kept in check and the council played out their games with the world. Farden made his way deeper into the valley and down into the citadel. 
Night was starting to fall. And the city was buzzing. Down in the streets it was noisy. The gutters were full of water from the winter snows and God knows what else. People leant out of windows and shouted to others down in the street, while others gambled and bartered in the narrow alleyways. Merchants hawked their wares, bellowing at passers-by, and women painted with gaudy colors whistled and grabbed at some of the finer-looking men. In Krauslung, everyone seemed to live on top or underneath everyone else. The buildings were piled story upon story, until each house or shop or tavern seemed to lean against the next, making the streets seem like the darkened arteries and capillaries of some immense living thing. Barden loved it. In the gutters of the city, nobody paid attention to him. He could melt into the alleyways and market stalls and nobody would look twice at the shady mage. Even the pickpocketing children ignored him, knowing better than to mess with the mage. Farden kept his hood low, staring about the place. At long last, Farden turned onto one of the main avenues that ran through the city, where the crowds became thinner and slightly more civilized, and a bit more sunlight reached the streets. He looked up at the tallest buildings, at their stained glass windows and their arched slate roofs, and a few faces peered back at him. From behind the colored glass, they sipped at delicate goblets and picked daintily at tiny bits of something in their hands. In the city, the finer citizens claimed the upper levels. They had made social class a matter of mere physical height. Farden snorted and carried on, taking it all in as he walked. He watched some of the more established merchants relaxing at their stalls after a long day of profit, smoking pipes and chewing on tough bread. Arca soldiers stood on every corner. Their polished silver armor shone in the last rays of the day's light. A tavern to Farden's right erupted with loud music as two bards, or skalds, rallied the patrons with loud tales of heroes, beasts, and magic. The drunkards all sang along, and several spilt out into the streets to slam their tankards together in flurries of brown ale. The soldiers looked on distastefully. To his left, a group of fine ladies, their faces painted and hair tied up high, ran gloved hands over jewelry and ornaments at a shop stall. A few of the women had pet geese by their side. The fat birds were decorated in the same colors as their owner's dresses and held on thin velvet leashes. They honked quietly, impatiently waddling from side to side. <clears throat> Farden smirked. The fashions of high society females had always escaped him. All he knew was that the wishes of rich ladies always held sway over the coin purses of rich men. Farden caught himself staring at one of the blonder women who looked a little like Cheska, but he pushed her from his mind and kept walking. Shop windows called out to him with bright colors and signed, Potions, lotions, and notions, magical remedies for all. Victor Ut, purveyor of blades and pointy weapons, fine clothes for fine women. This last one was accompanied by a little wooden notice that proclaimed, No beggars allowed. This was how the city was, more so in recent years than ever before. The poor lived below the rich, so close and yet so far, neither crossing the gap between the classes but willing to live in rough harmony as long as their peaceful ways of life were maintained. And that was where Farden thought he fitted in. He was not rich, but neither was he poor. Simply somewhere in the middle, an unknown stranger ignored on the streets. Instead, he thought himself part of the glue that held the Arca together, a servant of the ruling magic council whose job it was to maintain this balance, this way of life for these naive people. It felt abruptly odd to him, lost and unnoticed in the bustle of the city, how thankless this task was, yet somehow he was still stubbornly dedicated to it. It was not as though he was a mere pawn, though. If the world of magic was a game of chess, then Farden would be a knight. Farden headed north along another wide street lined with houses. He fixed his eyes in the gates of the Art Cathedral Fortress ahead of him and started the long walk up the sloping street towards them. <coughs> Chapter 5 See, I think those Archmages is sneaky. Why else would they keep us all out of their pretty tower, secretive-like? 
And you know, I heard that their heliart blow can change the weather, make it rain and all that. See, now that scares me. If it were up to me, I would have us people running things, making sure we're not up to no mischief and all. We're the ones who knows best. What, the war? Well, that was all about gold or land or something. Yeah, it was definitely about gold. Overheard during a conversation in a Krauslung tavern. Far in, a loud voice rang out through the marble corridor. The mage turned to see a familiar face creasing with a big smile and an outstretched hand coming toward him. Under mage, always a pleasure. Farden grinned back and shook the proffered hand warmly and vigorously. <clears throat> it's been too long, Farden, too long, and you could dispense with that under mage rubbish. You know me better than that. The Lord Vice flashed a smile that was crammed with white teeth and clapped Farden on the shoulder. I can see you haven't changed, still playing the politician as usual, said Farden. They both laughed as they carried on down the corridor. Vice was an old friend and somewhat of a mentor to Farden. He was a powerful mage and had known Farden almost all his life, ever since his uncle had delivered him to the school, just a young boy. Vice had been an instructor and somewhat of a legend amongst the pupils, a war hero. Over the years, step by step and bit by bit, he had climbed through the ranks of the Arca to sit beside the Twerk Mages, the powerful Heliard, and the wise Audrin. Rumor had it that Vice was actually doing the council some good. Farden was honored to have a friend in such high places, someone he could trust in the upper echelons of pompous Arca society. Vice cut an imposing figure, a good half a head taller than Farden and powerfully built rather than lanky. He had a long ceremonial knife at his hip as a mark of his office and wore a black and green robe that whispered softly against the marble floor as he walked. The Undermage's colors. His dull blonde hair curled and spilt over a tall forehead that was just beginning to show the lines of age and the stress of politics. His dark brown eyes were warm and welcoming, while his defined jaw and high cheekbones gave him a regal air. Farden knew the raw power that Vice hid behind his usually calm exterior, and had seen those eyes flash with furious magic more than a few times. Vice had taught Farden many of his old tricks and spells. However, he wasn't a written, and he couldn't begin to compare himself to the power of the Archmages. As they walked, the affable Vice threw an arm around Farden's shoulders, stealing him down the corridor. He spoke in a low voice as a few servants passed. His purposeful eyes flicked between the marble flagstones and the huge arched windows lining the hallway. The sun was starting to set behind the mountains. This is a dark time for us, Farden. I hope you have some good news, he muttered. I have news, but whether it's good or not will be up to you and the Archmage's vice. The tragedy at Arkfil has hit us hard. It's one thing to lose our valuable scholars in such a brutal murder, but to have a dangerous spellbook taken from our safe hands is even worse. Vice shook his head and clasped his hands behind his back. I agree, said Farden. He paused as several guards swung open a large door and snapped their heels together as the two men passed. They sported short spears and circular shields and wore the same green and black of the Undermage's position. The mage waited until they had passed through the door. Whatever is going on and whoever is behind all this, we can't afford to waste time. That'll be your good news, I assume, said Vice dryly. He rubbed his clean-shaven chin. We'd better discuss this with the council. They're waiting for you. He pointed ahead to a wide gilded door, one that Farden had walked through only several times before. Another gang of guards in full ceremonial armor, gold, and green steel flanked the thick doorway. Their shields were like mirrors, and their long spears were so tall they almost scraped the arched marble ceiling. Their golden helmets covered their entire faces, and they nodded to Farden and Vice as they approached. Farden straightened his shoulders and cleared his throat loudly. <coughs> Let's go in. Vice motioned to the guards, and they pushed hard on the heavy doors. They swung open agonizingly slowly. As Farden stepped into the great hall, he tried to keep his mouth from hanging open. It was like stepping into a white and gold cavern. Every time he came here, it never ceased to amaze him. 
Marble pillars lined the room. Tall white columns carved like tree trunks so that their bases spread over the floor like gnarled roots. Their tops flaring out across the roof like thick ivory branches where they entangled themselves in the huge beams and gilded rafters that resembled the ribs of some huge fossilized animal. Light poured through windows that stretched from floor to ceiling, from one end of the hall to the other, fitted with the finest stained glass that the artisans of Krauslein could ever hope to make. Farden watched the rainbow light play amongst the ivory branches and golden wood, painting the white floor every color he could imagine. He scanned the men and women in places, frozen forever in the patterns of the colored glass, their old faces emotionless and regal, staring impassively out of the windows at their successors. The mage kept walking, following Weiss to the front of the great hall. Almost a hundred people stood around them, loitering amongst the pillars and benches, clad in robes and dresses of various hues, talking in low voices and pointing at the mage. Varden ignored them. In the center of the great hall stood a statue of Avernia, surrounded by candles. Sitting at her white marbled feet was a set of gold scales, hanging balanced and even, the symbol of the Arca. Two ornate weights sat in each side, old relics belonging to the Archmages. High above her head, a huge diamond-shaped window was open to the cold sky, and the cold wind whined across the opening. Through it, Farden could see the sky turning a dusty pink with the dying sun. A single star dared to peek through the fading daylight, sparkling gently. At the front of the hall stood three giant chairs, two equally sized ones in the center and a smaller one to the right. Here were the twin thrones, and here sat the Archmages Heliard and Audrin, rulers of the Arca and the heads of the Magic Council, powerful, wise, and beyond contestation. Vice swept from Farden's side to take his place on the smaller marble chair. Guards hovered in the shadows between the pillars. Farden stopped several feet short of the three men on the chairs and bowed low to the ground, sweeping back his hood as he did so. Silence fell in the great hall. Welcome, Farden, to the Ark Cathedral. I trust your journey was swift? Audrin spoke first. He was a short man, with kind blue eyes and a balding head sparsely decorated with copses of gray hair. Ajahn was thin and aging, but the powerful man still wore the long green and gold Archmage's robe with pride and a strict posture. He hadn't changed one bit since Farden had last seen him. It was, your mage. Farden rose slowly and nodded with his most courteous smile. To Audrin's right sat a tall man with a long, sharp jaw and mahogany eyes that roved busily over Farden's clothes and apparel. <clears throat> For his age, Heliard was surprisingly thick-set and muscular, echoes of a long life spent on the battlefield. He sat bolt upright and stern in his marble throne, spine and jaw stiff, his pale hands resting on the broad arms of the chair. Heliard's hair was cut short and was a dirty blonde in color, with streaks of white beginning to surface through his trimmed curly locks, like worms appearing after a heavy rain. He had a habit of looking down his long nose at the people he addressed, and a love for impatiently interrupting council members he deemed too unimportant to speak. The austere Heliard sighed theatrically. Tell us of your findings then, Farden. If this news is as urgent as I'm told, you'd best be out with it, he said with a dismissive wave. Yes, Lord Heliard. Farden took a breath. He spoke slowly, with a measured tone, striving to remember every detail like Durnus had told him. He was unusually nervous in front of these old men. The book that was stolen from Arfel is a dark elf spellbook, a manual for summoning creatures and beasts from the other side. A few days ago, I traveled south into Albion to find a scion hermit named Jurgen. He had been part of the team of scholars that first discovered the book in an ancient elf fortress in the Tossenbauer Mountains. The same team that went on to decipher and cast some of the spells. Jurgen spoke of the worst and most powerful of them all, something he said they called the mouth or mouths of darkness. They never dared to attempt it and before they got any further, the old dragon had the book banished to a location in southern Nelska and the sirens never spoke of it again. The Archmage just thought in silence for a moment. 
Several of the council members murmured between each other conspiratorially, like gossiping maids. Ajahn asked a question. What of this Jurgen? Could he be the one responsible? No, your mage. Jurgen has become a pathetic hermit, nothing but a slave to his curse. Varden paused as the others threw quizzical looks at him. He was bitten years ago by a lichen on the ice fields, and since then has lived in hiding, a broken and pitiful man under the spell of the curse. He hasn't left Albion in years and is still hiding on the moors in a hovel. He's innocent. And you're sure about that? asked Heliard. The murderers at Arfel were committed by more than just your average masochism. We know that, said Vice. Audrin nodded. Heliard licked his thin lips with the lizard tongue and tried on a smile. I hear a rumor that you might be one of the finest written we have, Farden. Where were you when this book was stolen? There was a burst of outrage in the hall, mingled with a few accusing shouts. Audrin banged his fist on the marble throne for quiet. One moment, I'm going to take a sip. <clears throat> okay. Farden was shocked and momentarily speechless, standing there with his mouth open. He tried to think of a careful answer as silence was slowly restored. It hung like lead in the hall. Your mage, I agree that we must examine every possibility, but as for me, he looked the archmage squarely in the eye. When this terrible crime was committed, I was in the north of Albion on a mission given to me by my superior. Pardon paused. The accusation had kindled a little rebellious streak in his heart. But perhaps if I might be so bold in saying that if we are turning this investigation on the Arca and our own mages, perhaps even the Magic Council should be considered? <clears throat> a few more shouts came from behind him, and a low rumble of discontent murmured through the gathered council members. Arrogant bureaucrats, Farden thought, making an effort to stand straighter. Audrin held up his hands for silence. No one here is being accused. Farden is a loyal servant and has served us well through the years. Archmage Heliard is merely being cautious. Vice agreed with the murmur and Audrin changed the subject. I'm curious, why did they fail in summoning this creature? Was it purely fear, he asked? Farden took the hint. Jurgen informed me that this spell requires one of the dark elven wells to bring the creature across from the other side. He also seems to think there may be one in Emanesca that we have yet to find. Heliard scoffed, and a ripple of laughter ran through the council. Did he draw you a map? shouted a mocking voice from somewhere in the crowd. Farden stood even straighter. He knew something, and I believe him, he said confidently, looking to Vice for help. <coughs> If what Farden says is true, then I thank the gods that the Sirens didn't ever find a well while they had this book in their possession. Such a force would have made them unstoppable. Vice smoothed over his friend's words. Audrin held up a solitary finger. If the murderers need a dark elf well to summon the creature, then we have no choice but to believe this lichen and try to find this well before they do. Only then can we catch the ones responsible and prevent disaster. Yes, your mage, agreed Farden. Audrin, the wills have been lost to us for years. He cannot seriously believe that one still survives. Heliard chuckled in mock humor. Believe me, I have led many expeditions to find one. As have I, Archmage, interrupted Vice. I agree with Farden. We need to make sure that this creature, these mouths of darkness, is never released. The only way we can do that is beating them to their source of power. The Undermage looked Heliard squarely in the eye while he spoke, and the star man snorted and looked away. Farden could have sworn that Vice flashed him a triumphant wink. Audrin cocked his head to one side, as if waiting for the answers to come to him. How, then, if we have been searching for decades, can we find a lost well? Our records simply do not go far enough back in history. The others in the hall were silent in thought. A few still sniggered amongst themselves, and Farden contemplated changing their minds with a kick firebolt. 
But he kept his hands clasped firmly behind his back. And then it came to him, something Jurgen had said. Some of the dragons could have memories of the Dark Elves in their tear books, he suggested tentatively. The dragon riders have been silent for years now, and not a single messenger from Nelska has passed our gates since we agreed on the ceasefire, Heliart scoffed. And that was 15 years ago. Do you expect them to just hand a tear book over? Farden bit the inside of his lip as he turned to look at Vice. Lord Vice? he asked. Whispers scurried through the council crowd. All eyes turned on the Undermage. Years ago, in one of the final battles of the war, Vice had bravely led a small group of soldiers through a secret tunnel into the siege-locked fortress of Ragjarok, home of the old dragon Farfallen. After a long battle through the ice tunnels, Vice killed Farfallen and took his tear book as a trophy. It was one of the few great victories of the war, and the blow had been heavy on the sirens. Songs were still being sung in the taverns of the great Undermage and his fight with the gold dragon. <clears throat> Farden had only seen a tear book once during his lifetime, and that had been half burnt and half buried in mud. Tear books were large tomes filled with lines and lines of dragon script, hieroglyphs that held the dragon's memories like a sponge holding a lake. When a dragon's tear was dropped onto a blank page of an empty tear book, the memories would write themselves over the pages, and the dragon can store his past in one single book to be read as a history of his life, and to stop them going mad. The older the dragon, the longer the tear book. Some span millennia. Far Fallen's tear book is empty. It has been for years. Vice shrugged, and a susurrus of disappointment echoed through the hall. Tear books fade when they aren't in the presence of their dragon. Eventually their pages go blank. Farden thought for a moment, letting a dangerous idea bloom in his mind. He dared to speak up again. They were not gonna like this, not one bit. Your mages, he began, trepidation building inside him. What if we took the tear book back to the sirens as a peace offering and a gesture of goodwill to gain their help? He did not get any further. The hall exploded into outrage chaos. Shouts ricocheted around the hall. Madness! To suggest such a thing is treason. Get him out of here! Audrin held up his hands, but the hall raged on. The noise was deafening. Heliard was incredulous. He leant far out of his chair and gaped wide-eyed at Farden, as if that the mage had just squatted down and taken his shit on the marble floor. How dare you! That is an Outrage! bellowed the Archmage. His face turned a crimson shade of purple. Audrin banged his fist on his throne and waved his other hand for silence, but none came. Heliard was still shouting. How do we know the sirens weren't responsible in the first place? Varden looked to Vice for help, but he was busy shouting down another ignorant council member. Varden yelled out over the pandemonium. The dragon riders were the ones who originally banished the book, your mage. And if they see how dangerous the situation is, they may help us in finding the well. Heliard slapped his thigh angrily and pointed at the mage with an accusing finger. Of course they will, and once we do, they'll stab us in the back and summon the creature for themselves. You could start another war with your foolish actions, he boomed. And you could start one with your inaction, snapped Farden. He could feel the magic bubbling up in his chest. He wanted to slam his fist into the Archmage's nose and teach him a lesson. How dare you lecture me, barked Heliard, his face red and full of indignant veins, his jaw pointed and condemning. Farden could feel the old Dark Mage's magic making the air twitch. Guards, remove this! Enough, Audrin roared in a voice quite unnatural for a small figure. Everyone froze, the echoes of angry words hanging awkwardly in the hall. With a snort, Heliard sat back in his throne and moodily drummed his fingers on the marble. This is a place of reason and discussion, not petty squabbling and shouting. If you want that, then go find it in the streets. I will not have it here. Now, does anyone have anything sensible to offer? After a moment of Audran's earnest glaring, 
Weiss raised a hand and spoke in a measured tone to the hall. I suggest that Farding go as an emissary to Nelska and speak with the Siren Elders. Farden fixed Weiss with a shocked look. Weiss held his gaze and continued. I would rather gain their help than try to face this threat alone. This concerns all of Amanesca now, not just the Arca. Farden fidgeted with his hands behind his back, strangely excited. Audrin sighed. Then it is down to a vote. Heliard? He looked at his counterpart, who still hadn't taken his stormy eyes off Farden. Choose your side, said Audrin. Heliard was the very picture of rage. Arms folded, he languished in his chair like a spiteful lizard, still boring into the mage's skull with his wooden eyes. I say that the dragon biters are the ones to blame. <clears throat> and we'd be foolishly throwing everything, and I mean everything, into their claws. I say no. The tall man shrugged, shoulders scraping against the polished marble throne. Vice? I say yes, the undermage said firmly, without missing a beat. Farden should take the tearbook back to Nelska. Victoria's drums started to play in Farden's head. A smile began to creep into the corner of his cheek. Audrin paused for a moment, and everybody seemed to hold their breath. The suspense verged on painful. He looked up from the marble floor. I say yes. And here entered the proud trumpets. The council rumbled with mixed opinions. A scatter of applause came from about half of them. Farden saw some of them nodding and smiling to each other, while others shook their heads and crossed their arms. He looked back to the thrones, to Vice and Audrin. Thank you, Archmages, I will not fail you. Farden bowed his head in a quick nod and put a clenched fist to his breastplate. Vice will show you out and find you accommodation in our cathedral. We will meet at the West Pier of Rose at dawn. May Avernia bring you a restful sleep tonight, mage. Audrin said warmly and gestured to the doors at the back of the hall. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I keep glancing to the door. My dad went in for my grandma. Vice stood quickly and led Farden away from the seething Heliard. The crowded council stared like hawks at the two men. Thank you, hissed Farden once they were out of earshot. Don't mention it. The gold door slammed shut behind them and their steps echoed loudly in the stone hallway. Yet somehow, the narrow corridor was a relief after the claustrophobic hall. They talked as they walked. I've never seen Heliard like that, said the mage. Vice nodded. Mm-hmm. He's very... What's the word? Passionate about his views. And in other words? Farden grinned, not convinced by his friend's tactful words. He's a stubborn fuck, said Vice, fixing Farden with a serious look. He should have been a tyrant or a warlord rather than an archmage. It would suit him better. There is no place in the council for people like him. It's time to compromise and open our doors, not to lock them even tighter. It's been a while since I heard you speak your mind, Vice, and I have to say, I prefer it to all that delicate democratic shit, said Farden, still in a low voice. The corridor seemed empty. He looked over his shoulder to make sure. Vice nodded, and so do I. Audrin seems to know how to handle him. After 25 years, I would expect him to. He knows things are changing, and he's willing to change with them. The problem is Heliard has many a supporter in the council, so Audrin has to be delicate and democratic and find a middle ground. I could never do what you do. Sit there and let all the politics wash over you, said Fadrin. No, you prefer it out there in the wilderness with fire and a sword, where it's up to you and nobody else, chuckled the undermage. Fardum patted the sword resting against his shoulder blade. Politics can run a city, or define a nation, but men and magic are still what counts. You can't hammer in a nail with words. No, but you can start a war with them, that's why we still have to be careful with the sirens, said Vice, slowly coming to a halt. He looked at his friend. Can you handle this, Farden? The mage stopped in his tracks and crossed his arms. He frowned. Straight to the point. What happened to the diplomat in you? I have to ask, Farden. This is bigger than anything you've ever undertaken. You'd be the first Arca, never mind a written, to set foot in Nelska in 15 years. 
I only suggested it be you because, well, who else is there? Farden tried to conceal his pride. He shrugged. It has to be done. If I'm the one to do it, then, well, that's that. I go to Nelska. Vice slowly shook his head, hiding a smile. I always knew you were going to be difficult the first day I met you. Just be careful. You're no use to the Ark of Dead. The two men continued to walk. Please, I get enough of that from Darnus, said Farden. Ah, and how is that dusty old vampire of yours? It was Vice's turn to frown. He's fine. Farden tried to skip that particular subject. The Undermage had never been fond of Farden's placement in Albion, nor Darnus. Just get me on a ship with that tear book and I'll handle the rest, he said. All right. You heard Audrin, Dawn, at the West Pier. And you guard that old tome with your life. Don't let it out of your sight while you're on the ship. Or in Nelska, for that matter. Vice wagged a figure and Ard at Farden. Don't show them the book, either. As in, he waved his hand towards the mage's back. Farden understood. I know. They can't be trusted any more than anyone else can. He listened to the sound of their footsteps for a while. What happened in Arfell? I mean, what really happened? They turned a corner and Vice looked about conspiratorially. <clears throat> Three of the old men were so charred and burnt, they didn't even recognize them. The other two were found dead on the floor, slashed wide open with the blade. In the morning, the others smelled something burning and saw the blood seeping out from under the door. He shot Farden a serious look. It was an assassination, pure and simple. And a skilled one at that. Fuck, said Farden. He couldn't think of anything else to say. They came to a small spiral staircase leading downwards into the citadel and Vice stopped. I think it's best if you stay somewhere other than the Ark Cathedral tonight, after what had just happened. There's an inn nearby, on Fradia Street, called the Bearded Goat or something like that. I hear it's surprisingly nice, by Krausling standards. You sound like an old widow, sniggered Farden. And remember, dawn at the West Pier. I'm never late. That's very funny. The undermaid shook his head. I won't see you tomorrow. I have to make sure that our fell is protected. I'll see that the tear book is sent to Audrin tonight. Heliard has business to deal with in Albion later, and I wouldn't trust him with it anyway. He'd probably burn it, he said with a scowl. Albion? Farden looked at him questioningly. Something with one of the dukes near Kiltiran or Denera, I forget. Official business. He shrugged, and his row bristled. Farden nodded, wondering what the Archmage could possibly be doing in Albion. The mage stuck out a hand, and Vice shook it warmly with both of his. Thank you again for this opportunity. And for how you supported my arguments in front of the Archmages. I don't think they would have listened to me otherwise, said Farden. I think we're doing the right thing, friend. And I'm glad the Arca has somebody like you on our side. Vice clapped the mage on the arm. Now, be careful in Nelska and remember what I said about words. Diplomacy is sometimes necessary. I'll see you tomorrow, Vice. Farden spun around and disappeared into the stairwell, taking the steps two at a time. May the gods be with you, the other maid shouted after him. <clears throat> Night fell quickly, darkness slipping unnoticed into the streets and rows of the city. Torches sparkled, and the noises of the evening began to fill the cold air. Two figures walked silently through an alleyway, cloaked and hooded, near to where the main wall met the mountain rock. The gods one? May the gods be with you? Maybe you've actually read this before? Um... As they wandered further and further away from prying eyes, hands reached out to torches, and they hissed and died. The shadows were as thick as black velvet, and the two strangers knew it. Farden pulled his hood back and held Cheska's hands tightly. She smiled at him through the darkness. I told you I'd find you, she said. I'm glad you did, he replied, barely finishing his words before he felt her lips catch his. Her hands curled around his back as they leant against a nearby wall. <clears throat> they kissed hungrily, holding on to each other for what seemed like an age. Cheska finally pulled away, almost breathless. How long are you staying? Farden hesitated. 
They're sending me away again at dawn tomorrow, he said with a sigh. Even in the darkness, he could see her disappointed face. Her voice was small. When will you be back? Varden didn't even need to answer. She felt him shrug and shake his head. I suppose being Arca's finest has its drawbacks, she added, resting her head against his shoulder. She was usually excited by his missions. Varden stroked her hair. I'll come back, don't worry. Cheska nodded. I don't doubt you will. You always do, but I just want to spend more than an hour with you before you disappear again. She said and kissed his neck. I know it's dangerous for us. And now that there's the ritual, it'll be against the rules. I know, Farden scowled at the shadows. But I don't care. I want you. So do I, she said. But before she could continue, there was a loud shout from nearby. And the orange light of flame started to creep up the alleyway. Someone was singing. Why is it so dark? Sang an off-key voice. Barton growled and moved to stand in front of Cheska. They put their hoods up, letting the shadows cover their faces. A man appeared from around the corner, holding a candle and tottering from side to side across the cobblestones. He was drunk and being particularly loud. Barton took a step forwards, and the bleary-eyed man noticed the two figures standing in the dark with an expression of confusion. Whoa! Hiding in the shadows, are we? He slurred. He gave the hooded pair a wide, stumbling berth and leered at Cheska. Who's your pretty friend, mate? She can come home with me if she likes, he laughed. Quiet yourself, fool, before I do it for you, snarled Farden. The mage took another step. Cheska put a hand on his arm, holding him back. Don't, Farden, she whispered. He nodded, Dernus's words echoing in his ears. Keep moving, said Farden. And the man did hollering and hooting with every step. As the light receded, Farden moved back in the shadows and wrapped his arms around Cheska. She toyed with his hair. You've always been so quick to anger. I don't much like people, he scowled, watching the darkness. But you like me. You're different, he said, giving her another kiss. You're not like the others. Somehow you can keep me calm. Well, up until now. He heard a sharp intake of breath. God's fart, and you have to stop worrying about this ritual. I'm ready for this. And what does your father think of it? My father and his precious advisors gave up arguing with me a long time ago. He knows it's what I want, and begrudgingly he leaves me to it. As should you. Please stop worrying. Do you blame me? He asked. Jessica shook her head. No, but we can deal with this when you get back. Not now. Fine, said Farden. I think it's time I left, she whispered in his ear. She kissed his cheek. Please be safe wherever you're going. Farden held her wrist and winked. I'd tell you if I could. I know, said Cheska. Then she kissed him once more, lingering on his lips. She ran a hand over his weathered face before turning away and melting into the darkness. Farden stayed a while, waiting until it was safe, then walked off in a different direction. <clears throat> An hour later, Farden was sitting in the bearded goat, quietly sipping his drink and minding his own business. Weiss had been right. The inn was loud and full of drunken fools, but the quality of the beverages and food was good, and Farden had found a quiet corner by a fireplace in the dim recesses of the room. I'm going to finish this chapter, and if we still have time left before then, um, I'll put on something for us to watch, because my tooth is starting to hurt from moving my mouth so much. And I don't want to, like, over-aggravate it. <clears throat> so, yeah. Uh, a scald was regaling the rumbustious crowd with stories about the infamous fairy incident. He stood on a table near the door, playing his stringed liot, kicking tankards of beer with his muddy feet and belting out the words at the top of his voice. A few women in thin, frilly dresses lounged about the place, grinning at any man who walked by, beckoning them closer with crooked fingers, nails painted with gaudy yellows and reds. The men cheered and clanged their tankards together, singing along, swinging some of the more sober women around in drunken jigs. <clears throat> the mage watched them impassively. Alcohol worked in mysterious ways. Farden looked back into the crackling flames and swirled his sweet red wine around in its wooden cup, 
thinking about his day, trying not to think about Cheska. The fire was warming his cold toes, even through his thick traveling boots, and the warmth and the wine were starting to make him sleepy. He shuffled closer to the fireplace, pulling his hood down over his brow, blocking out the noise. Someone coughed and spluttered nearby, and Farden glanced in the direction of the noise. Next to him, nearer to the wall and draped in shadows of the corner, was an old beggar smoking a long, dirty pipe. Farden had seen him earlier, snoring away to himself near the warmth of the fire, but now he was awake and peering about the place with his beady rat eyes. The gray man was ugly, unshaven, and unkempt, with greasy hair and dirty patchwork clothes made from a hundred different garments. Sprouting from his narrow chin was a straggly beard coiled in dirty strands and plates, with bits of dried stew clinging to it. He busied himself by chewing on the mouthpiece of his curved pipe. Gnarled fingers drummed annoyingly on the arm of the wooden chair he was curled up in. Farden looked him up and down, then went back to his wine. The smell of the beggar's acrid tobacco tickled his noise. Farden tried to let his concentration melt into the warm fire, but now he could feel somebody's eyes on him. He turned back to face the beggar and met his eyes. His little ronin eyes sparkled with a cheeky glint. What do you want? asked Farden. The beggar chuckled, his whole body shaking with the effort. His tobacco smoke breath rattled noisily in his throat. Oh, nothing. Thought I'd look at you seeing as you're looking at me. He waggled his pipe in Farden's general direction. You look like a strong fellow, though, don't you? All quiet and sad on your own. He croaked, leering at him with a mischievous smile. What's it to you? Oh, nothing at all, friend. Just making conversations, all. The beggar shrugged and sucked on his pipe. It rattled against his dirty yellow teeth. Well, I'd appreciate the peace and quiet if it's all the same to you. Farden looked away. But out of the corner of his eye, he saw the man leaning closer. Smoke escaped from his mouth like thick gray liquid and coiled towards the ceiling. You that mage? The one I heard about? Farden didn't move. There are a lot of mages in Krausang, old man. I'm not one of them. Hee <laughs> hee, fair enough. He cackled hoarsely, wheezing and slapping his knee, obviously finding great humor in the answer. But I seen you around, mage. Running here, running there. You're important, they say. One of the older ones. I heard about you and those minotaurs several years back. Said you almost took them all single-handed. Saw you at the Arc Cathedral too, and I can spot those pretty man braces a mile away. The beggar winked, nodding to the gold poking from under Farden's sleeve. The mage crossed his arms and eyed the man suspiciously. He wondered if he had seen this old wreck before. He looked familiar. Ah, you nothing to fear from me, big strong lad like yourself. He paused, taking a drag of his foul-smelling pipe. Farden wrinkled his nose. The man sucked his blackened teeth and held it towards him. Fancy a bit? he asked. Farden looked at the moldy pipe and shook his head with a grimace. I don't smoke, he said. The old man shrugged and looked around furtively with his red eyes. His voice dropped to a hoarse whisper. How about that, then? And you look like the man or a man who does. Maybe you prefer to chew it. His eager eyes scanned the mage's face, and there was an awkward pause. I said I don't smoke, and I don't chew tobacco either. Farden narrowed his eyes threateningly. His patience was wearing thin. I wasn't talking about tobacco now, was I? Farden stared at the fire. This conversation is over. I don't think it is, mage, chuckled the beggar. He cocked his head to the side like a pigeon assessing bread. You never smoked it before, have ya? He leant forward confidentially. He looked around at the unfamiliar faces of the bar and sniffed. You're wasting your time only chewing it. Nevermore is meant to be smoked, mage, said the beggar, and tapped the bowl of his pipe on the arm of the chair. Farden opened his mouth to say something, then closed it again. He reached out towards the fire and felt the heat creep over his hands. A loud bear of laughter came from the bar. He took a deep breath through his nostrils and let the smell of pipe and wood smoke fill his head. How much? he asked. The beggar waved a bony hand and shook his head, as if he had just been insulted. <clears throat> Sometimes an old man just likes a body to smoke with instead of being on his own, see? Makes a change, don't it, mage? 
The man coughed with the hiss of a man on his deathbed and a waft of bad breath. Don't call me that, Varden warned him. The man shrugged again. As you wish, he said. Varden's mind raced while he swirled the wine around, making a whirlpool in his cup. Temptation billowed in low clouds over his head. He chewed the inside of his lip. <clears throat> Unwelcome thoughts gathered. Memories and dead faces laughed at him. Cheska hovered in his mind, pale and still. He wanted to stop thinking. Fine, he said, then gulped down the last dregs of his drink in one swift move. I'm at number 16, if you can count that high. The one with the red door? With that, he swept up the nearby staircase and disappeared into the shadows of the corridor. After finding his room in the gloomy hallway, he opened the door and lit the fireplace with a quick spell. He opened the window to let the cold night air freshen the room and reclined in a nearby chair, impatiently playing with sparks on his palm. A short while passed before there came a bony knock on the wooden door. Come in, Farden whispered gruffly. The old beggar shuffled to the door, hunched and crooked. The man might have been tall once, but long years had bent his back and added lines to his face. In the firelight, his skin looked like weathered oak. He now wore a gray cloak, also made of patches, over his rags. Have a seat, Varden gestured to the chair opposite him. Give me a moment. The man ignored the offered chair and squatted in front of the fire. He pulled a few items from his pockets and placed them on the brick hearth. Gnarled hands toyed with them. Varden pointed to one, a strange pipe, curved but coiled and fat in the middle. It looked like a cross between a snail and a horn. What's that? the mage asked. Gim, skiff, red raw, blag, nevermore. You always smoke it in a pipe like this one, the beggar muttered. He unfolded a bundle of cloth and started to peel something apart, placing little crumbs of red moss into the bowl of the pipe and pushing it down with his little finger. Once it seemed to be full, the man sprinkled some of his cheap tobacco on the top and tapped the thing on the edge of the fireplace. He looked at the fire, shook his head, and then cast around for flint and tinder. Then he had a sudden thought and looked up at the mage. Do you mind? He said, waving the pile in little circular motions. Farden fixed him with a murderous look as he accepted the bite. If I find out that you've told anyone, anyone about this, then I will find you, old man, and I will kill you. Understand? The old man shrugged and shook his head, trying to portray the image of sincerity and trust. Don't know nobody to tell, mage. You can trust me, the beggar winked. Don't call me that, said Farden, irritably. He held the pipe in one hand, and with the other, keeping an eye on the beggar, pointed at the bowl. A little flame appeared on his fingertip, making the stuff crackle and hiss. He felt the acrid smoke burn and scrape his throat. He coughed and spluttered. <clears throat> Tastes good, don't it? Chuckled the old man. With great difficulty, he got at his feet and placed himself down in the threadbare armchair. It's harsh, Barton groaned. He took another painful drag and tried to relax in his chair, feeling a slight headiness tingling all throughout his skull. He offered the pipe back to the old man, who grabbed at it with grubby fingers. They sat in silence, listening to the music from downstairs escape into the street below the window. The man watched Farden smoke the pipe with a hungry expression, but Farden didn't even notice. He held the smoke in his chest, feeling the back of his eyes shiver and his temples quiver. His arms felt a hundred feet long and his fingers moved through sickly honey. They passed the pipe back and forth and soon enough Farden found himself melting into the chair like an icicle in the morning sunlight. His mind ran through feels of the absurd, random music scattered between his ears. Strange shapes moved about his room, searching for reality under the bed and behind the curtains. The old beggar shook and bounced, and his jittery bed shifted around in an earthquake. At some point, Farden looked up to find the pipe in front of him again. The thing glittered like an angry torch, sparking and puffing fumes into the air. Smoke filled his eyes. His lungs burnt. An intense feeling of dizziness pounded against the inside of Farden's skull. He closed his eyes to watch colors collide and opened to find he was alone. The old beggar was long gone. Yum, yum, yum. Hi, kiddos. Thank you for the bits. The bed evaded him for a while, but at last he caught it, falling into a lake of pillows and sheets. He kicked off boots that were hot and heavy. His tunic was made of thick soup. 
A pillow hijacked his head and he drifted off into a heavy drug laden sleep. I appreciate the lurk. Gods danced around his room, and daemons watched from the corners and rafters, quoting something about blood and history. Darkness took him. The old man slipped out from the mage's room and closed the door quietly with a click. He threw a hood of his greasy hair and kicked at his rough leather shoes as if they annoyed him. With great care, he hobbled downstairs and weaved his way between the drinkers and singers that filled the noisy inn, still worshipping the ale that foamed in their tankards. The beggar shuffled past them, muttering quiet excuse me's and coming throughs as he did so, and finally he made it onto the street. He paused to stretch. After a satisfied slap of his thigh, he disappeared down the nearest alleyway, seeming taller and more nimble with every step. <clears throat> a loud drunk came around a corner and careered down this narrow alley towards the strained beggar. The drunken man leant into his path, shouting and singing loudly in his face. The smell of his wine-soaked breath was overpowering. The beggar fended off the drunk with a push, but in a fit of anger, the man cursed and swung his arm in a wild punch. The beggar reacted with a speed that belied his ears. A short black knife darted from under his patchwork cloak and plunged into the drunk's side with a thud. He clamped his palm over the man's mouth and threw him hard against the nearest wall, pausing only to viciously twist the knife. The man grunted in pain and shock. Stabbing him twice more in the chest, the beggar left the dying man slumped to the cobbles. Without a moment's hesitation, he pulled his cloak about him and silently disappeared into the night once more. Left to die alone in the cold, muddy street, the drunk gradually slipped away, a bewildered look still plastered across his pale face. I think that was the end of it. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> such um, positive music to end on such a negative note. 